My name is Stefan Timmermans and I'm the chair of the sociology department here. You are witnessing our inaugural uh, event in the Spotlight on Sociology series, um, in which we feature some of our faculty and we'd like to present some of their work to the friends and alumni of the department. This is one of many exciting initiatives we've been trying to take in order to reach out. We have also been organizing some alumni panels where we invite um, some of the people who graduated here with an undergraduate degree in sociology and sort of see how they leverage that degree into their very interesting careers. Um, I have some good news to report. Um, a couple of days ago, a US News report came out with their rankings for sociology, and we're still ranked as one of the top departments, especially in the areas of historical comparative population, sociology, and stratification. But of course, um, US News reports only looks at some of the things that we do, and we're actually also very strong in urban sociology, in immigration, in health, and many other um, topics. So, but it's nice to get some recognition, because you never know how this works with those rankings. Um, so, we couldn't have found a better speaker for our first lecture here today. Um, our speaker today is Professor Abigail Segi, who also works as the Vice Chair for Undergraduate Affairs. And she has been, uh, she has a new book out, What's Wrong with Fat? Um, and if you have been following the media, you saw that this book has received quite some attention. There were editorials in the Washington Post, there was a book review in the New York Times. But you will not have to read those things because you will just hear it from Professor Segi herself. So please welcome Professor Segi. Thank you, and it's a, um, it's a pleasure to see you all here today and to talk to you about this um, new book. So um, let's get right to it. I'm, this is obviously not a class, but I'm going to begin with a multiple choice quiz. You're just going to think about it, and then we'll discuss it, or I will discuss it. So what would you choose as the answer to this question? Fatness is A, a medical problem, B, a public health crisis, or C, a form of diversity that deserves legal protection. I'm not a mind reader, but I suspect that most of you would be leaning towards A or B. And in fact, if I were to have used not the word fatness, but obesity, which is a much more common term, then you'd be even more likely to rule out C. In fact, this term obesity that we take for granted and talk about as a thing, I will argue, is a frame. It's a medical and public health framing of fatness. So, but we'll, we'll get to that. So in, the, in this book, I ask several questions. I ask, how is it? What are the social factors that explain why we have come to perceive fatness as a medical and public health crisis? So I'm intentionally using this word fatness as opposed to obesity because I want to encourage you to step out of your taken for granted assumptions that we know that we're talking about a medical problem and a public health crisis. Fatness has its own connotations, but it doesn't have that connotation of a medical problem, public health crisis in the way that obesity does. Right? As soon as we say the word obesity, it becomes really difficult to imagine that this might not be a medical problem. How could, could someone be obese and healthy? That seems like an oxymoron. And that's because this term obesity that we take so much for granted has built into it this medical and increasingly public health frame. So I want to understand, in this book I try to understand the social factors that explain how we have come to prioritize this particular framing. I'm also interested in the social implications of understanding fatness in this way. Who benefits? Who loses? How does this understanding affect our lives? And finally, I explore alternative ways of understanding fatness, and this fat rights frame is one alternative that I'll be talking about today. So this is drawing more broadly on this concept of framing. I've mentioned it, uh, now I'll tell you what I mean by it. Well, one definition of framing from a communications scholar is the selection and emphasis of some aspects of a perceived reality in such a way as to promote a particular problem definition. So what you see in this is the idea that 
the world is too complex to be understood in its entirety, in its buzzing, blooming confusion, we simplify. And framing is one way that we do. And so when we, we take a frame, we are emphasizing some aspects of reality and de-emphasizing others. And this has political implications, which is you know, very clear with one example, very two alternative framings of abortion. In one case, your abortion is framed as a woman's decisions over her own body, and that's referred to as pro-choice. On another, abortion is murder of an unborn child, pro-life. And you can see those very dramatically different ways of framing what is, in fact, the same thing. And they, of course, lead to different understandings of what should be done, what's acceptable, what is um, desirable. So again, every frame is partial, obscuring as much as it reveals. This is a, an illustration from the book that takes this concept of framing and imagines it as opera glasses. And so we have here three different uh, people observing the same opera, called here the, I don't speak Italian, but l'epidemia di obesita. And so this, these are the framing debates that we most often assume. We, t we take for granted that there is an epidemic of obesity, and the framing debates are about who is to blame and what should be done. I call these blame frames. And so you have here one, um, the first man, looking through a frame or a lens of personal responsibility, and he sees a timeless story of desire, transgression, and its inevitable consequences. The man next to him is looking through a societal frame and sees a different play, a wrenching portrait of poverty and ignorance. On to his uh, right, a woman is looking through a biological frame and sees a tragic saga of a fragile soul inured in a prison of flesh. But, so they're seeing different things, but there are all of these different frames of who is to blame and what should be done are reinforcing this idea that the problem is a, is a public health crisis. And you can see down below, the woman from the fat acceptance um, movement is not admitted in. She's told, shh, madam, please, there's a performance in progress, and is, is shushed away. So part of the book, I look at these blame frames, but today I'm going to take a step back and look at an even more fundamental frame, which is what I call these problem frames. What is the problem? Is it a medical problem? Is it a public health problem? Or is it a problem of rights and discrimination? In the book, I examined three additional ones, but I'm trying to simplify it and make it a little more <laughs> digestible for our, our, um, our discussion today. And so what you see in this graph is that each frame implies very different things about what is wrong, if anything, with fat, the title of the book, what should be done. They're drawing on different traditions, different intellectual and political traditions. I call these master frames. And they're also drawing on very different analogies. Analogies are very persuasive, and they're using different analogies to make their case. So, um, so we'll, I'm going to go through each of these in turn, but what you see here is, well, we could go through them very quickly. So the, the medical frame, the p what's wrong with it is excess weight is a medical problem. This, what should be done then is we need to find medical solutions. It's drawing on a master frame of health, and the analogies are things to other serious illnesses like cancer, but also to behavior that's associated with health risk like smoking. The public health risk moves away from the individual and the individual's clinician to a population view. The problem there is not that individuals are becoming ill, but that at the population level, uh, increasing weights is a public health crisis. So here what needs to be done is not help the individual, but address this at a population level, reduce, reduce BMI. And we've seen a shift to this public health uh, frame in the 1990s, the middle to late 1990s, and it's what you're probably most familiar with when you open the paper and you see this obesity epidemic, they're invoking this public health crisis frame. It's drawing on a master frame of health, but also economics. This is bankrupting us. We can't afford the burdens of obesity. And it's drawing again on smoking, a, self, a, a, a risky behavior, but also the analogy to an epidemic to create fear.
The fat rights frame has a very different perception of what's wrong. Nothing is wrong with fat itself. The problem, according to this frame, is weight-based discrimination, which is perceived as a social justice problem. And so here, what should be done is we need to, fat, we need to combat fat bias and weight-based discrimination. They're drawing on a very different master frame, which is also quite strong in the American political context, which is that of equal rights. And they're drawing analogies not to smoking or cancer or to epidemics, but to race, sexual orientation, gender. So <clears throat> this um, shows us where you can look at these one by one. Now, as I say, each of these frames, any frame, obscures as much as it reveals, right? It's partial. It's a partial account. So what are we seeing with these different frames, and what are we missing? Well, as I discussed earlier, this medical frame is invoked by the term itself, obesity, and it applies a, a medical frame. And it, what does it focus on? It focuses on health risks associated with higher BMI. There are indeed some health risks associated with BMI. These are real. H higher BMI is associated with greater likelihood of diabetes, greater likelihood of heart disease, higher mortality, especially for those in the highest BMI categories of over 35. But it also ignores some things. It doesn't, it's not compatible with other realities that we know to be true. That, for instance, those with a higher BMI are less likely to die of respiratory disease than those in the normal weight category. The, it, it, it is incompatible with this large body of research that's often referred to as the obesity paradox, which, so we know that people who are have a BMI of over 30, which is our definition of um, obesity and BMI is body mass index or which is basically it's just your weight divided by your height your weight in meters divided by your height uh, no, your weight in kilograms divided by your meat your um, height in meters squared we know that those people who are heavier have higher BMI are more likely to develop heart disease but if you look at a clinical population those who already have heart disease study after study has shown that those who are obese are less likely to die that this obesity frame is incompatible with that. We also know that there's um, lower mortality for those in the overweight category and no greater risk of mortality for those in this first category of obesity. So again, it, it ignores that. To, to another way of thinking about this, even for the risks that are greater for those who have a higher BMI, association, it's, the association is not perfect. So what do we, this is based on a study that was done to look at, they used eight different measures of cardiometabolic, to, pr pr um, to produce a cardiometabolic profile, so based on things like blood pressure, glucose levels, etc. And as you can see, those who are heavier, those who are overweight or obese, were more likely to have an abnormal cardiometabolic profile. But... There are, so you can see, but among those who have a normal weight, there were still 24% who had an abnormal cardiometabolic profile. That's 16 million Americans. And we miss that with the, with, the, um, with the medical frame. We also miss that among the overweight, there's 51%, 36 million Americans, who have a normal cardiometabolic profile, and for the obese, 32% or 20 million Americans. So this idea, the medical frame, implies that moving from a BMI to 29 to 30 is as if one moves from, Ill, from, from healthy to ill. But yet this shows that that is not, that car, that is not, a perf that's not exactly what's going on. Right? We're talking about relative risks. Um, not, it's not a, an illness the way it's often discussed. There's several factors that have contributed to the medicalization of, of uh, fatness, it, as have contributed to the medicalization of other things, like erectile dysfunction and, and, and other issues that I talk about in my lectures. Medical expansion refers to the way in which the medical profession has expanded to take jurisdiction or control over increasing areas of social life that were previously not seen as medical issues, childbirth, um, menopause, ADHD, etc. Scientific and technological innovation. This, is, this was a scientific and uh, technological innovation from the 60s that um, called you know, jaw wiring, which was supposed to lead to weight loss, 
because you couldn't open your mouth and so you would only <laughs> drink your food and indeed it did lead to weight loss the problem was as soon as the <laughs> mouth was unwired the weight was gained back which has been shown t to be the case for most weight loss diets if not all to at 90 to 95% the contemporary innovation is uh, gastric bypass surgery in which part of the stomach is removed or bypassed. And we know f in medical sociology that as different technologies become available, if, as there is a cure to solve a problem, it's more likely to become medicalized, as well as if there are pharmaceutical drugs that can be offered. And in the 1980s, there was massive pharmaceutical deregulation and expansion, which also led to more issues coming under the jurisdiction of medicine. So there's also this public health frame, and this is slightly different, as I said, from the medical frame. Here, we're not talking about the individual, but a societal-wide problem. And this comes through when the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services says, there is no doubt that obesity is an epidemic that must be stopped. So this idea of obesity as an epidemic, again, assumes that moving over from a BMI of 29 to 30 as it is as if you're moving from, from healthy to ill. So, and we see this, so this was a, a graph that was produced <coughs> by William Dietz um, and, and uh, propagated um, he, well, over in through talks, public lectures, in which we saw <coughs> the prevalence of people with a BMI of over 30. So again, assuming like this is as if it's an illness, and, and these graphs are, are quite frightening. So we go from this blue, these low levels of obesity trends over time to higher and higher levels, and using this red to, again, create fear. Um, and so the master frame here, is we meant, as I mentioned earlier, is not just health, but economics. This is going to bankrupt us, we often hear. And the analogies, again, to, to epidemic and smoking. So, um, so I've already um, dis discussed this. Again, it's really, th this discussion of the obesity epidemic is really relying on the logic that moving from a BMI to 29 to 30 at is equivalent to becoming, moving from healthy to ill. Now, one of the things that I explored in my research is the extent to which confirmation bias is part of the story of how the news media are responding to different studies because there is competing scientific claims about the health risks associated with obesity. But if the medical and public health frame is so taken for granted, then the research on confirmation bias would suggest that it will be more difficult for journalists as well as readers to perceive information that is inconsistent with this, these dominant frames. So that when research comes out that questions the, the dominant understanding of obesity as a medical problem and public health crisis, it will be subject to more skepticism. And so I had a wonderful opportunity to test this in that there were two different studies that were in obesity in the year 2000. So the first, and it was in both, in this very first study found 400,000 excess deaths associated with overweight and obesity. So the idea is that p if the people who were in the overweight and obese category had been in the normal weight category, there would have been 400,000 fewer deaths. That this being in this higher weight category led to 400,000 excess deaths in the year 2000. Now this was a, a, a really big finding because it suggested that overweight and obesity would soon overtake, it was catching up and might soon overtake tobacco as the leading cause of preventable death. Right, there's a, other assumptions based on that, including whether that obesity is preventable, that it's a choice, that it's under people's control. But we'll leave that aside for a moment. There were a lot of critiques of this study from within the CDC. It led to a revision. The authors themselves revised their own figure down to 365,000, but that's still a very large number. The following year, a new study came out by other researchers at the CDC, 
bringing the estimate down to less than 26,000. A big difference. And part of that was that while being in the obese category, obesity, having a BMI over 30, was associated with 112,000 deaths, which is a big number, not nearly as big as 400,000. But those who were in the, being overweight or having a BMI between 25 and 30 was actually associated with almost 90,000 fewer deaths because people in the overweight category, according to the study, were less likely to die than those in the normal weight category. And so when you added them together, added the overweight, fewer deaths, 90,000 fewer deaths, plus the 112,000 additional deaths, you ended up with this number of less than 26,000. This study, incidentally, has, is now accepted as the better study. CDC has it's, it's won awards, and CDC has now uses this estimate. Interestingly enough, they ignore the overweight part and just cite the 112,000 excess deaths associated with um, obesity. But they, this study has been confirmed to be the better study by um, experts in the field. But how was it regarded by the news media? So this is a question that I asked, and again, you can think to yourselves, what do you expect? And then I can uh, tell you what I found. Would you think that the news media would ignore the study that's inconsistent with their expectations? Would they celebrate it? After all, people aren't dropping in droves the way we thought they were. This is maybe cause for celebration. It's some good news. Or would they report on it and express skepticism? Well, it was C. This, so they, this, the second study actually got a lot of news media attention, even more than the first study. And so I, um, using a methodology that I can talk more about in the Q&A, identified 35 news reports on the first study, which I call the eating to death study, published within three months after the study. And using the same publications and search criteria, I found 61 publications on what I call the fat OK study. And then I coded them. I read through them and with the research assistants looked at their content. And this is what you see some of the res results here. So the dark <coughs> line is the eating to death study and the light bar is the fat okay study. And so as you can see, almost 80% of the eating reports on eating to death study suggested that this study confirmed what we already knew. It was unsurprising. Okay, that's not surprising really, given what we know about dominant ways of understanding this issue much less, they were much less likely to do that for the fat OK study. In, co in contrast, the fat OK study was not only more likely to be presented as surprising, when in fact it was consistent with a host of other studies. And there was a new study, a meta-study that was just published in January that accumulated all of the data from 96 different studies on this question, the relative risk of mortality associated with weight groups. And confirmed, came to the same conclusion that the, the risk of um, mortality among the overweight group was actually lower. They were also more likely to quote other scientists who were skeptical, who didn't buy it. Walt Willett at the Harvard School of Public Health called the study a pile of rubbish. That's the, that type of language was completely absent from the first study. They were also more likely to quote scientists who were supportive of the study because it was presented as more of a controversial um, study. And so I argue <coughs> that this is consistent with um, research on confirmation bias or the tendency to privilege information that confirms one's preconceived notions. And it helps understand why despite an, quite a bit of controversy and um, uncertainty within the scientific literature, most of you would not be aware of that because of the way in which the news media is both selective and then interprets these studies. So we've talked about the medical frame. We've talked about the um, public health crisis frame. Finally, there's a fat rights claim, claim, uh, frame. And this um, is a very alter you know, it's an alternative view in which fat itself or obesity is not the problem. The problem is weight-based discrimination, and this is a social justice frame, um, frame drawing on social traditions of social justice. And so the argument here is what needs to be done is we need to fight weight-based discrimination. They're drawing on a, a 
strong tradition in the United States of civil rights, and comparing weight to other identity categories that have some protected status, race, gender, sexual orientation, handicap. So we see this in um, this YouTube video that went viral by Joy Nash in which she says, I'm fat and it's okay. It doesn't mean that I'm stupid or ugly or lazy or selfish. I'm fat, F-A-T. It's three little letters. What are you so afraid of? And in fact, using this term fat is one strategy as other groups used, reclaimed the word black in the black power movement or queer in the queer rights movement to invert stigma. Use a word that has been used against them and reclaim it. And so um, this frame draws attention to weight-based discrimination. And I'm going to say a little bit about this because it may be an issue that you know less about. We don't read as much about it in the, in the media. So in, in employment, heavier women are less likely to be hired. They earn less. In education, there's um, evidence that parents pay less, are willing to invest less in their daughter's education when they're heavier. Heavier women are less likely to marry. When they do marry, their husbands earn less. Fat kids are targeted for bullying, and it doesn't end when they grow up. Heavier women talk about young men hurling insults or even food at them in public spaces. And this fear of humiliation leads many heavy women to avoid exercising in public. In extreme cases, it may lead uh, women, very heavy women and men, not to go out at all, depriving them of the face-to-face -face social in uh, interaction that is vital for their mental and physical well-being. Scores of studies have shown that medical providers typically review that regard their fat patients as lazy and non-compliant. When I was doing research for my book, um, one woman told me how she visited a vascular surgeon because she had developed a superficial blood clot after fall, and her primary doctor had recommended an ultrasound to make sure that there wasn't a deeper problem. The surgeon never asked about her relevant medical history, including whether she smoked or was on birth control pills, or how long she had had varicose veins, she told me. Instead, he took one look at her and concluded that she fell because of her weight and began talking up Fen-Fen, a weight loss drug that has since been banned. And unfortunately, these types of experiences are very common. Another woman I talked to spoke about visiting a new gynecologist who during the, um, her exam started lecturing her about her weight. She said to her, I'm a member of the Fat Acceptance Movement. I'm not, my weight is not up for discussion. And the doctor backed off until she had her in stirrups during the gynecological, gynecological exam, at which point she resumed her lecture. The woman I spoke to said, talked about going to another place in much the same way that victims of sexual abuse um, describe their responses to sexual abuse. And for insurers, weight is a reason to deny weight uh, health care coverage by classifying it as um, morbid obesity as a pre-existing condition. So the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act would make it illegal to deny health insurance based on pre-existing conditions, but the new law allows employers to charge overweight employees higher insurance premiums. So these are the kinds of things that the fat rights frame emphasizes. It also, of course, it downplays another aspect which we talked about earlier, which is the extent to which higher weight is sometimes associated with negative health outcomes. So again, each frame emphasizes some aspects of the reality and de-emphasizes others. Now the way I put these different frames in that nice neat graph gives a false impress impression that all of these different, the different groups, these different frames are on an e equal playing field. This is not true. Um, this graph is maybe a little technical, but the main point of it is to show how different groups vary in their the amount of capital, both economic and cultural capital, that they possess. So I'll just highlight very um, simply that the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance, down at the bottom, has much less culture and much less capital, both cultural and economic, than, say, the IOTF at top, which is the International Obesity Task Force, which has really promoted the obesity frame and has both funding from pharmaceuticals, so a lot of economic capital, and has recruited on its board 
but obesity experts, so it's also tapping into cultural capital. And so this, this difference of power, or if we wanted to see it in a more uh, um, of a simplified illustration of David and Goliath, also helps us understand why certain frames have, are heard more, right? It, it matters who you are, what money you have. Well, this is why you know, political parties spend so much time and money trying to promote their pr privileged frame. So the last part of this talk and of my book asks what effect do these different frames have on people's attitudes? So hopefully by now you have some, I've convinced you that there are different ways of understanding, different ways of framing fat and that the obesity and public health frame that we're so reliant on has its limitations and prevents us from seeing certain things. Um, and we have a sense of why um, certain, the, the, those have come to, per, uh, to dominate. But what effect? I mean, at the end of the day, we really want to know, does this matter? So what? Do these different frames, ways of thinking about fat, have any real impact on people? And so in the book, there's different ways that I go about that, this to try to determine this. One thing that I did is with, um, in collaboration with a former a graduate student in psychology and a current graduate student in sociology, we conducted a, a seven different experiments, enrolling a total of over 2,000 uh, participants. And in these experiments, we had people read one or several news articles which framed fatness in terms of, I'm going to only, I'm going to speak of a selective, to, a selective amount, but including as a public health crisis, in term, or alternatively as an issue of fat rights and then the control is just a, it was a control an experimental control meaning that it the, we had the alternatives is they could read an article that wasn't about fat at all it was an article about cancer and it made no mention um, to fat we used cancer so that it was still a medical issue so as similar as possible to the others and then we measured their attitudes about among other things, we'll foc I'm going to focus right now, health risk, weight-based prejudice and discrimination, or alternatively, the celebration of body size diversity. And so one might expect that people who read an article that was, taking a, that was framing fat as obesity, as a public health crisis, would perceive greater risk associated with heavier weight. Um, but do they... Some, would, some claim, some of the respondents that I spoke to claim that this type of reporting also reinforces weight-based discrimination. It justifies weight-based prejudice and discrimination. It, by stigmatizing fatness as a medical pathology and because also, and as I show in, my, in part of the other book, that our discussions of obesity tend to privilege an individual responsibility frame in terms of a blame frame. Alternatively, does a fat rights frame lead people to, at, um, to endorse the idea that body size diversity should be celebrated in the same way that race, racial diversity or gender diversity or other forms of diversity should be celebrated? So I'm just going to um, give you some, show you some of the results from one of the studies, from one of the experiments, it's experiment two. And what you can see here is that, <coughs> as expected, those, com so we can compare the two test conditions both to themselves, to each other, that's the red and the blue, but we can also compare each of them to the control, which should be the neutral one, to see which of the two test conditions is actually having the effect. And so if we look at health risk, we see both that those people who read the public health crisis are more likely to perceive health risk associated with obesity, and that those who read that fat rights news article perceive less risks associated, health risk associated with higher weight. In addition, though, we find that those um, who read the article taking the public health crisis frame were more likely to express fat prejudice, fat discrimination, and punitive, and so the punitive attitudes were things like, should, should we have health policies that charge heavier people more for health insurance? That would be an example. Now, for some of them, you don't have the effect of the fat rights. So, for instance, for the punitive attitudes, that the fat rights is not distinguishable from the control. So in some cases, it was only the effect of one. 
Uh, finally, for celebrating body size diversity, we see again that those who read the public health crisis framework are, are less likely to say that this is a good idea, and those who read the fat rights, the article that takes a fat rights framing are more likely. So, you know, this I think is important because there's a lot of news media coverage of the obesity epidemic, and the idea, I, I think, I think the intent is to draw public attention to an issue that's perceived as a public health crisis, a problem, so that people will take positive measures to improve their behavior and, and take health-promoting behaviors. But if this news media uh, reporting is also worsening stigma and discrimination, which in turn we know worsens health, leads to body image problems, leads to eating disorders, leads some heavier women not to want to exercise in public or to go outside and therefore in, uh, has a d negative uh, impact on their health. This is important. So in conclusion, <coughs> obesity, I've argued, is one way among others of framing fatness. And the dominance of this frame can be explained by social factors. And the, it is limited, it, uh, it, it captures aspects, some aspects of reality, but it also obscures others, and more importantly, it put, may have some very negative social uh, in, uh, consequences. In the same sense, reframing or thinking about fat um, in terms of fat rights frame may also miss certain aspects of this reality, but may be a, an effective way to reverse some of these social, negative social um, consequences. So at this point, I'm going to open it up to, for discussion and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Don't be shy. Yes. Hi. Um, I know this is more of a sociology talk and I have a background in both sociology and healthcare. So mm -hmm. I'm just a little curious um, when you look at your data and you were collecting research for the study, I noticed you use a lot of BMI references and I was wondering did you come also across a lot of body fat composition references um, because I know in healthcare there's a segment of the medical community that especially with insurance discrimination are trying to get people to move away from BMI comp um, measurements because they're completely inaccurate. For example, um, an athletic person is going to have a fairly high BMI but an insanely low body fat composition but health insurance companies don't get that data. All they see is a BMI that's insanely high and they want to charge them. So there's a lot of medical community who are trying to get people to stop looking at BMI and look solely at fat, body fat composition. So I'm wondering if in your um, data collection whether or not you were able to um, see a difference between the two and whether or not that truly has an effect on our discriminatory practices in society. So great question, thank you. Um, so there's a lot of people that do believe this, and it's consistent with our cultural preferences. Muscularity, especially for men, is, is culturally valued. Fat, high fat composition, especially, well, for both, actually, in different ways. It's, it's gendered in interesting ways. is devalued. There, um, there was, the, the, so a team of CDC scholars, and I'm happy to give you this reference after the talk, did a study to see whether these assumptions were actually correct. And they looked at um, skin fold, uh, waist circumference, basically all of the different ways that we have of measuring obesity. And looked at, um, do they do a better job at predicting mortality? So, you know, it's, it is mortality that we could look at other um, issue, different types of morbidity, and they might have found something else. This was for mortality. And what they found was that none of the other measures were better. They were equally poor. Um, that in, and the conclusion is that weight, no matter how you measure it, is just a very poor proxy for what we're trying to get at. And so there may, you know, and other, so, so, so others have done studies in which they um, control very, um, rigorously for set for physical activity they get people this is hard to do and you know and these other skin fold etc they're, they're more difficult to do bmi is very is popular because it's very easy but there's um there's been research that has uh gotten people on treadmills treadmills and 
measured very rigorously their physical fitness. And those studies suggest that when you control rigorously for physical fitness, which very few studies actually do, the effect of weight just disappears. It disappears entirely. And so that work would suggest that what's being picked up by the BMI is the physical activity. And so the idea would be that people who have a higher BMI, not the athletes, but most of the population are not the athletes, um, tend on average to be more sedentary. But it's not the weight that's causing the higher mortality or the health risks, it's the, um, the sedentariness. And so if we were able to control for that, we would have different results. And so that work, um, and I'm, I'm thinking of work by Stephen Blair is, is the lead researcher on this, has demonstrated this both for um, more all causes of mortality and specifically for cardiovascular disease. So the three frames are great, actually. One second. I'm told I have a really loud voice, anyways. <laughs> um, so uh, um, my question is, is I'm a little confused about something, so maybe my question is going to be a little confusing, but I get the part that um, we're assuming that weight gain is associated with a lot of health risks and mortality, and that might be false. So I, so I get that. Um, at least that's what I'm taking as you're challenging. And then there's a lot of... It's not weight gain so much, is higher weight. And so it... Okay. Right. So it's... So, got it. So higher weight is associated... Where currently the medical perspective that it's leading to the cause of a lot of medical Correct. issues. Um, whereas there's also these societal judgments and discrimination taking place. So what I wasn't sure if you were kind of implying or saying that the... Um, the attitudes existed before the medical association um, started, this trend towards we have an um, epidemic, or if that's kind of feeding into one another, and are they really in conflict, like combative? Can they coexist where we determine and continue to figure out if whether or not there is a medical relationship or not, um, but doesn't mean we need to treat diff people differently as a result. So. Thank you. So my, not my own work, but um, other people's work has established very clearly that our cultural distaste for fatness precedes our, the medicalization of it. And um, s historians, there's some debate about whether this, the devaluing of, of fatness in the American context happens for the first time in the, at sort of the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, or a, a, a recent dissertation was just completed in which he says there was a, there was a momentary blip in, uh, towards the end of the 19th century in which heavier bodies became valued, but before that they were, they were devalued. In any case, the medicalization of, of fatness and the term obesity emerges in the middle of the 20th century. And so, and what historians have shown is that this happens when first middle class white women are going to the doctor and seeking weight loss treatment because it's unfashionable to be thin. And then in response to their demand, doctors start providing treatment and, and then start taking this under, um, under their jurisdiction. And so we see in the 50s and 60s the emergence of bariatric medicine, a specialty, a specialty in uh, weight and weight loss. We see journals formed to focus on the issue of, of weight and health. The shift towards the public health crisis frame happens much later. It happens in the mid to late 1990s and it's uh, in response to seeing higher population weights. Um, but in fact, according, th there was also at this time, the cutoffs, particularly for overweight, were lowered, um, which contributed to seeing, to the impression that you know, s many more people were overweight and obese. So you're saying the attitudes changed first? Yeah, all of the historical data. So that's not my own work, but I draw on it in the book. It says, yes, the attitudes change first. And um, if, I mean, if you look in, so what's the cultural and economics behind that? I mean, if you look at societies in which food is scarce, being heavier is highly valued, typically. 
it's seen, I mean, and this is where you find girls being force-fed for, or, you know, young girls sometimes, or adolescents being uh, force-fed for marriage. There's the understanding that they won't be marriageable unless they're fat. And the, this, the cultural meaning there of the fat is status and, and wealth. And this is completely reversed in the contemporary period where um, the, well, the high status people tend to be thinner and where it's become more expensive to be thin. The, you know, the, the gym membership, the nutritionist, the it's, et cetera. So I think that the, the cultural attitudes have a lot to do with uh, social distinction. In your experiment with the different frameworks um, versus the control, did you guys um, look specifically at fat respondents? We did not. And in fact, um, we have very little representation of people who would be categorized as obese. And so that is definitely a limitation of the study. And it would be great if we or other researchers could replicate these um, studies with a, a greater uh, variation in terms of BMI? That's a great question. Hi, so piggybacking on what she just asked, I'm not sure that you're able to control the, the pool of individuals that you, or, or to control the respondents. Um, I guess that, that's one of the questions, were you able to, and if you were, is there a reason why none of the respondents were in the obese category? Are you asking what explains the limitations of our sample? Yes. Um, so we had most of the experiments were drawing on a university population. So I was working with a psychologist, and this is the... You know, very the common. UCLA the UCLA headlines featured uh, my, my book and it went around the whole campus. I got an email from a cardiologist here on campus and we had lunch and we talked about our work and she told me about um, how when she first did research looking at a clinical population of people with heart disease and wanted to see what the relationship between BMI and mortality was. And she was new to statistical analysis. And so when her findings came back showing that there was a negative correlation that, 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 act, you know, that would suggest that those with higher BMI were less likely to die, she went to her advisor and said, I think I did this wrong. <laughs> this must be wrong. You know, well, he said, no, you did this right. And it, there's actually a large body of, of research um, suggesting that. But you know, that's, I think that's in the findings and how we interpret the findings. But what questions do we even ask? You know, we, we tend to ask questions that are consistent with uh, our, our worldview, which is very much a social. So we're asking what are the risks of obesity. We're not necessarily trying to see, well, maybe, you know, maybe other things explain this or maybe it's beneficial in certain ways. So I think we're running out of time, so, but there's probably lots of opportunity for more informal conversations afterwards. I want to thank Professor Segi for a wonderful lecture, and I want to thank all of you for showing up at our inaugural Spotlight on Sociology series, which hopefully will be the start of a much larger project. <coughs> thank you. Thank Professor you. Segi. Thank you all.